Ms. Ross. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you very much, Director Ray, for being with us today and for your patience. I know it's been a long day. Um, I have two lines of questioning, so um, hopefully we can get through the first one quickly because my second one is the area where uh, Congresswoman Dean wanted to talk about use of force. Um, but the first I have to go to, because I'm from North Carolina and it deals with the Colonial Pipeline. And in my district, um, mm -hmm. during that horrible week-long period, about three quarters of our gas stations uh, simply didn't have the fuel for uh, my constituents. Can you walk me through the different ways that a company employing inadequate cybersecurity measures could endanger federal supply chains um, like, the, like this case, and especially with um, crucial needs like oil and gas infrastructure? Well, I, I think uh, it's, of course, a very good question, but I think a, a fulsome answer to that would way, ex way exceed the amount of time we have allotted. Um, so I, I want to be sensitive to your, your time constraints here. Certainly, uh, all critical infrastructure increasingly uh, is dependent on um, uh, internet connectivity uh, and increasingly online. And so the, to the extent that a company uh, doesn't have strong cybersecurity, we are more and more dependent uh, on their cybersecurity for our physical security. I think that's one of the things that the recent ransomware attacks demonstrate is that it's not just affecting those companies, but it can affect the average American at the gas pump or when they're buying a hamburger. And so, Director Ray, do you think um, that Congress should take actions to have mandatory cybersecurity standards for private folks doing critical infrastructure? Well, I, again, as I've said in response to other topics, I want to be careful about uh, proposing or weighing in on specific legislation. But I will say that I do believe that the private sector uh, piece of our cybersecurity as a nation uh, is absolutely indispensable. And until we figure out a way to ensure that the private sector has adequate cybersecurity and maybe just as importantly, a key part of cybersecurity uh, is closely lashed up and informing, informing the federal government, uh, the FBI, CISA, et cetera, uh, we're going to have a problem adequately defending the country. And so I think anything that, that kind of goes at those issues is something worth taking a close look at. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, on the use of force issue, I want to quickly follow up on that issue, especially since Representative Dean didn't get a chance to ask her question. And I want to talk about the FBI's uh, collection of use of force data. I've worked on this issue in North Carolina with full cooperation from law enforcement on um, traffic statistics and um, who gets stopped and who gets searched. And um, we have a pretty model legislation um, in North Carolina for doing that. But given the possibility that at the FBI National Use of Force Data Collection Program may be um, discontinued as early as December of 2022. What other options are there for collecting law enforcement use of force data? Um, and what have you considered and how long would it take to establish an alternative? Well, I could, I'd be happy to have my staff follow up with more detailed information. What I would say is that we're working very hard to, uh, to increase the reporting um, and we've been of national use of force data because we believe strongly that um, only through that are we going to be able to have a thoughtful, informed conversation that's actually based on the hard facts. And I think we've made good progress. I think we recently now crossed the threshold of about 40 percent of sworn, I think that's about right, 40 percent of sworn federal, state, and local law enforcement officers across the country. And we're driving hard to try to get that number high enough so that we can start sharing the results of that uh, collection more broadly. So it was a big, big milestone. One of, the, uh, one of the milestones we crossed recently allowed us to take certain steps, and we're hoping to cross the future milestones uh, before too long. But anything that you can do uh, to encourage the uh, law enforcement community, you not just you personally, but members of Congress can use to encourage state and local law enforcement in their uh, communities to provide that data uh, would be, certainly be appreciated. 
Well, uh, I will certainly do that in North Carolina. Um, do you have any um, estimated time for when you might be able to provide some information when you have a, a critical amount of that? Gentlelady's time has expired. The, uh, the witness may answer the question. Uh, let me have somebody follow up with you about where we are on time estimates. They, uh, I'm not sure if I've got the latest on that. Thank you, Mr. Director. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Mr. Ray was flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm a you know, huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues. And ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases, and this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like, unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. 
and they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other capital she's ever been in is a state capital that's open 24 seven. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they wanted to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is, it's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.